Hi, everybody. I'm Austin Alclair, and I'm so happy to be here at Neuroscope today. Um, I am a treasure hunter, um, and I blame my dad for it, um, which is appropriate because it's Father's Day here in the, in, in the U.S. Um, it goes way back to when my father uh, was serving in, in the Air Force, and we were stationed uh, in the Philippines in the 80s. Um, he would assemble expeditions out into the jungles looking for this fabled treasure, uh, Yamashita's treasure. Um, it was lost by the Japanese during World War II and it was never um, found, or at least in theory. It, uh, lots of uh, theories abound. Um, I would often accompany him deep into the jungles um, as he would assemble these expeditions, uh, stopping at villages along the way. And my mother, my siblings, and I would play with the, with the Negrito children as he would get his party together and go diving into the jungle. Um, he never found the treasure, but our home was littered with these, uh, this ephemera of World War II um, because the local museums wouldn't take it. Um, one, just the, the place, the, the jungles were just littered with all these artifacts from the war. And also, just the Filipino uh, museums just didn't want these pieces of um, left by the occupiers, like they weren't interested in keeping this stuff. So our house is filled with rusty pistols, machine guns, hopefully diffused landmines, um, these gorgeous little medicine vials are made of you know, really pretty glass. Um, it, it was just, co it covered our house and it captured my imagination because these things were left out deep in the jungle and they probably had these tragic and unknown backstories attached to them. Um, and that just kind of stuck with me thereafter. Um, so from an early age, seeking treasure was a, was a big part of my life. And now I'm an avid geocacher and a consumer of location-based experiences that kind of take me out into the world. Uh, for those of you who might not know, geocaching is this um, hobby, sport, game that's been around for about 19 years now where uh, people hide containers all over the world. They post the latitude and longitude online and then players go find them. Kind of the main, one of the main rules of the game is that you have to sign your name in the log um, within the geocache. Um, it's taken me to some, some really awesome places. Um, in, in theory, they're supposed to be placed at uh, you know, locations of interest, but that's not always quite the case. Um, this one was found like it was a magnetized Altoids tin on a guard rail outside of, it, outside of a Denny's. Um, <laughs> not quite adventure. Um, so growing up as I did, but also during this era just of incredible technology uh, advancing quickly, it created this love of technology that puts special layers over the real world. Um, I, I adore anything that has me running around the real world while I also get to have this, this extra uh, layer of adventure. Um, I started out being a kind of a consumer, a player of these sorts of experiences, um, but I started then to create them myself. Um, I just wanted more of them. I, I kept um, just digesting them as quickly as I could find. I created multi-stage geocaches where you had a story kind of propulsing the player around. Um, I discovered a, um, a, a guy named Sean Alexander. He had written some code for Twine that pulls in geolocation data through your browser. So I created an experience for that and forced the, the people at the Baltimore DC IF meetup to play it. Um, uh, for the bulk of my life, I worked at a large uh, regional nonprofit theater where um, I would create kind of story-based scavenger hunts and just try to shoe them, shoehorn them into all of our audience initiatives, even if it didn't necessarily make sense. Um, for instance, we did a production of uh, Winner's Tale where I created a short piece that tracked your location and the story was like you were being chased by a bear around the theater. Um, it didn't get a lot of use, but I, I felt good. Um, even so, so all these projects were just fueled by this impulse to create. I wasn't, um, I was just firing ideas off into the world and I, I definitely wasn't being paid for it. Um, I was writing this little blog, just kind of keeping track of the, the things I've played and the things I enjoyed. Um, then just through a series of coincidences, good luck, and then a, a friend who was a, a saint and kind of championing this little blog, um, I, I met somebody who started this little company called Trapes, where I now work. Um, and kind of core of what we do is we create scavenger hunt walking tours, and we get hired by main streets and historic business districts to create these walking tours. Um, the quick version of that is that I build out these walking tours that are made up of multiple stops. 
Um, you have to answer a puzzle or a riddle, um, kind of depending on something you find at the stop to, to kind of prove that you were there. Um, the geofence unlocks, and um, once you've done so, you can move on. Um, typically, they're themed around the, the town's kind of character or, or something that they're, they want us to promote, so history or a pub tour, a shopping tour, um, and those are all well and good. Um, you create little bits of, 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 um, of what you find to, to proceed through the, uh, through the tour and kind of solve a greater puzzle uh, as well. Um, but we wanted to experiment with kind of a newer idea, or at least a newer idea for Traips, where um, the walking tour would un unlock pieces of a puzzle, or a, of a story, uh, as well as those puzzles, um, wrapping a kind of a fictional adventure around your wandering. Um, this came up for a few reasons. Uh, one, it's just fun to, fun to write and fun to create. Um, but also, sometimes we would get hired by a small town that I would discover some interesting fact about that town that I just couldn't get out of my brain, but it wasn't enough to build a whole tour around, or at least not easily. Um, and you know, sometimes trying to establish a connective thread was, was too hard. Um, take Abington, Virginia, for example. They're a small little town on, this, on the southern border of Virginia and North Carolina, home to the Barter Theater, where once upon a time you could buy tickets with vegetables and livestock. Um, there's a thriving restaurant and shopping district, a healthy ecotourism, but there wasn't, it wasn't like a singular thing necessarily. I was kind of struggling to build a tour that um, just was exciting me. Um, and it, it, like it didn't have a lot of history. It was kind of a, a, a point where white settlers would head west. Um, didn't, there wasn't any major thing that happened. Um, except there was one minor incident. Um, famous frontiersman Daniel Boone once stayed there for like a night some wolves came out of a nearby cave and attacked his dogs. Um, that was it. <laughs> but Abington's really latched onto that. So everything around the town is wolf-themed. There's wolf iconography everywhere. They do like a big public art campaign where they have people decorate wolf statues and they place them all around the town. Um, and there's a plaque at the site of the supposed cave. So I, it, this was like a fun little fact that I just couldn't get out of my head. Like this was, it, like it wasn't, anything important, but it was, it was charming that they ran with this wolf thing. Um, so in, I couldn't put together a tour necessarily, so I wrote instead, I wrote a story, a fictional story about Daniel Boone's ax being stolen from the visitor's center, and these ghostly wolves were attacking the town. And so every, putting together a series of kind of historical sites in the tour, every time you completed that stop, you would get a piece of this story. Um, and the tour ended up getting far more traffic than any of the other stuff that I had created in this, in this little town. So there are plenty of applications of lo location-based storytelling. You can um, talk about escape rooms, immersive theater, but my definition here today is, is very specific. It's about um, location-based experiences that uh, take you outside and are GPS dependent, usually using a smartphone. Um, not that what I'm talking about couldn't be used elsewhere, but uh, today I'm specifically talking about um, that, that sort of experience. Um, so <laughs> it's a rough outline. Um, so next I'm gonna go through some rough categories I've kind of assembled as I've played a lot of these things. Um, I'm not usually one for genres and, and category definitions, but it's just a, it's a useful way of thinking about these things. Um, and you know, I'll go over some examples, I'll go over some tools, and then if we have time, we'll do a uh, Q&A. So I, I try to go out and, and, and grab any location-based experience that I can, and over time, um, I've done a lot of these. Um, you can easily argue that I may lump one into one category and it belongs into another. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, it's just a, a rough way of thinking. Um, so the first kind of category I've I didn't really come up with it. A friend of mine, Melissa Ford, who comes to the meetup, and you may have read her book about twine. Um, it's uh, literary ge geocaching where there are experiences where that give you a great sense of a treasure hunt. You actually have to go somewhere to unlock a, th a piece of the story or, you know, or whatever. Um, this is probably my favorite kind of experience. Um, so the first example I'll give is um, is an experience called The Silent History. It's a serialized story for digital devices. It's a, a really great read unto its own. It's 
um, a bunch of um, kind of stories put together about this um, world and this unknown phenomena that's going on. Um, but what grabbed my attention initially was that it has a location-based aspect. Um, you would read the full story, and then you can contribute to the lore of this world. Um, but you could write these little stories, and then they would drop them into this, this map with pins. And then you had to physically go to that place to unlock and read whatever that person had written. Um, and you can contribute to it itself. Um, the writers had actually had seeded a bunch of these pins as well. With, um, so I was super excited to go find one of these short stories, especially after I had finished reading the, the core story and I was really hooked by it. But the problem was the only pin in Washington, D.C. was at the White House, <laughs> at the West Wing, specifically. Um, so I, I'm not far, so, um, so I hopped on the metro, went down, and I, you know, post 9-11 security, that's about as close as you can get. Um, it's actually worse now. Um, so then the, the pin's geofence was so limited, I was nowhere close. So I kind of gave up after, after a while. Um, later, we got tickets to the Easter egg roll. Um, this was at, during the prior administration, so it's not as yucky. Um, <laughs> So the, you know, the huge crowds were a, a big nightmare of mine, but I was like, I gotta unlock this pin. I really wanna see. <laughs> um, I got like right up against the, the building on the South Lawn, nothing. Oh. It still wouldn't unlock. <laughs> um, so I, you know, Melissa Ford and I had been chatting about this. She had read the story as well. Um, she, her day job takes her inside the White House and she asked a staffer to unlock it for us um, she actually got, she was in the press room, and just as she was asking the staffer, it, some, like her GPS jumped, and she was able to um, unlock the pin. Um, so what was in this story? Uh, well, it, it wasn't actually very good. It was, um, <laughs> it was about a member of the Washington Wizards basketball team who visited the White House, and his son was sick. And it was, it was just like, we went through all this for that. Um, later, I'll talk about why that's bad, you shouldn't do that. But, um, if you're gonna make something that hard, make it worth it. Um, my next example is, a, is an app called Code Runner. It is now defunct, um, but it's actually one of the things that kind of got me into this, this sort of um, gaming. Um, Code Runner was a spy game that had you running around unlocking pieces of a story. Um, the way it, you could drop dead drops for other players as well. Um, the way it worked was that um, you would point your phone in a particular direction and it would seed those little pins um, in that direction using its um, database of, of, uh, of locations. Um, so for instance, uh, it would want you to hack a security camera and so it would identify a bank in that direction. So you would have to physically go to that bank and you would get that piece of story. Um, I, I really liked um, Code Runner. There was one kind of mechanic that I really enjoyed in that you could, if it pointed you in a weird direction, you can change your direction, it would reseed the, the missions, which was really useful because I was playing in um, Southeast DC where there are a lot of um, high security facilities and it, it would often want me to wander onto the military, military base. <laughs> um, so this was great so that I wouldn't get shot by Marines as I was playing a silly game. Um, so more people should steal that mechanic because it's, it's something I've not really seen uh, much thereafter. Um, so we all know Twitter is a garbage fire, but um, it's still my main way for getting gaming news. And I saw a meetup um, retweeted in DC about a storytelling group that was um, checking out this geolocative audio experience using an app called VoiceMap. Um, it was gonna be telling a serialized story. Um, VoiceMap hosts several segmented pieces of an audio file and you travel around and as you get to that spot, it would unlock that piece of audio. Um, your phone would you know, verify that you were in the right place. Uh, I really liked the design of this app because it would give you walking directions as part of the audio experience, which is something I, I've not seen very often. Um, one of, the, one of the, my biggest pet peeves about these experiences that take you outside is I hate taking my phone out of my pocket constantly. So it was really great to, to not have that immersion broken by being able to you know, listen to these audio pieces it tell you know it would beep at you if you went off course. You know, you know, turn left at Pennsylvania Avenue, and you can just keep going without um, without losing that immersion. Um, so you know, I broke away 
uh, you know, I broke through my social anxiety and made the trip. The author, Kate Gorman, was there um, and had us walking around the National Mall and some of the Smithsonian's gardens. Um, and uh, it was a, a really great experience. Um, the next, that's, a, that's the gardens themselves, very pretty. The next kind of category, or uh, let me talk about some of the, the parts of this category that I like and, and dislike. Um, again, this is my favorite kind of experience. Uh, I'm a treasure hunter. I, in this category, re re rewards that impulse. Um, you walk through the real world with um, intense, you explore specific places, and you're rewarded with pieces of story. Um, you're half treasure, half treasure seeker, half spy, um, except the dead drops and buried treasure are chunks of hopefully interesting story. Um, the geography around you enhances the story. When, when, again, when I played Code, Code Runner, I was walking past all these high security installations with high walls and razor wire and security cameras everywhere, and I felt like a spy even though I was a, a nerd in, in business clothes on my lunch break. Um, you know, you feel like you're saving the world or doing something nefarious. Uh, when I did the, the Greenway Quartet on, on the mall, you know, I'm in this urban fantasy story um, completely immersed in it. Meanwhile, there's kind of bumbling tourists over here and angry commuters over here, and I, I feel like I'm doing something very secret as, uh, as I'm running around. This high-stakes story is going on. Um, another good thing about the format is that it lends itself really well to user submissions and community building, um, especially if it ha visually has a map that you can drop pins onto, again, with the, the, the silent history. Enthusiastic audience members can contribute to the content of your story, um, kind of bolstering it and helping it grow in new and unexpected ways. Um, your experience can get a second life. You can keep it, keep it going beyond the, the initial burst of content. Um, on the flip side, um, and I don't know if these are necessarily bad things, but they're things to, to look out for when you're building this sort of experience. But, um, you know, I just told you that user submissions are great, but um, I will counter that immediately with that. Uh, you know, you, th th that comes with its own set of pitfalls. Um, with the silent history, I didn't end up submitting my own story, even though I very much wanted to, because part of their rules were that you had to read this multi-page style guide and this kind of story Bible. Um, and I, I totally get it. They, want, they wrote, wrote this great story, and they wanted to protect this world that they had created. But it immediately kind of put me off that I was having to do this extra homework, and I just wanted to kind of tell my own story you know, within this interesting world. Um, and of course, with user submissions, you're going to have to deal with people being weird. Um, <laughs> just how it goes. Um, <clears throat> people, and the other, like, probably the biggest problem with this sort of this style of location based game is there's a certain catch 22 of you need a certain base of users to get going, but you can't really get going unless there's content in the app. So it's this kind of um, cycle of you know, nobody's going to contribute to your thing unless there's things for them to experience, but they're not going to go out and create ex experiences unless there's things for them to experience themselves. So, for instance, I was playing this, um, this app game called Fidget Box where you could drop stories atta and attach them to physical locations. And I ran around D.C. like on my lunch break kind of writing these short little stories and, and attaching them to various parks. Um, but then nobody w in D.C. was using the app, and so nobody was reading my stories. And there, was no, there were no stories for me to read. And so I just stopped using the app, and eventually the, the app went out of business. Um, so that, you know, there is kind of a capacity problem with that, with that style. Um, there's also a problem with this category when you get, you're, you're tying it to a specific place. Um, that will automatically limit who can, who can check it out. Um, the loca location-based story I created for the meetup using the Twine code um, was tied specifically to the University of Maryland's campus because that's where the meetup, uh, the meetup was going on at that time. Um, I had players walk from those little blue emergency stations with the cameras and speakers that you typically find on campuses. And uh, like the story was a hacker had taken them over and was speaking to the player uh, through those, those towers. And you, would, you would go from tower to tower, um, unlocking more of the story. But, you know, that was uh, university camp. University of Maryland's campus is big and sprawling, and this was a very kind of far-flung corner of it, which will just automatically limit who's going to be checking this thing out. 
Um, so when you're creating something like this, you really have to temper your expectations about how many people and, and who is going to be uh, checking it out. Um, you know, it's one thing to create one of these from the National Mall, it's another for some you know, interesting but far-flung location. Um, this category is a little bit more wide-reaching. Um, they are experiences that depend on you being out and about um, and moving, but you can do them anywhere. Um, these are probably a little bit more well-known, especially Zombies Run. Um, they're two games that tell a serialized story via audio clips. Um, the walk just out and out uses a pedometer to measure your walking. Um, you walk a certain number of steps and you unlock an audio file. Um, Zombies Run is similar, though it's a little looser in its rules. You can turn off the GPS, like if you're on like a treadmill, and still, um, still unlock the, the pieces of the, the serialized story. Um, if you do use the GPS for Zombies Run, and kind of the main hook of it is that every so often it will declare like zombies detected, and you have to increase your speed or zombies will eat you. Um, uh, it uses your, your GPS uses your you know your speed to measure that you've increased your speed for a certain amount of time, um, and then you can be safe if you've done so. Um, it actually taught me to be a better runner because it, I had to better pace myself, so I always had a little extra gas in my tank in case the zombies came. Um, I you know didn't spend all my energy. Um, experiences like this can really enhance uh, basic chores like exercise. Um, if you're willing to kind of buy into the buy into the story a little bit more. One morning it was um, you know still very dark. It was very foggy, which is not something that happens a lot where I live. I was out running, and this big buck deer comes charging out of the bushes right as it declares zombies detected. <laughs> I was so scared, <laughs> I, and I've never run so fast. Um, that, like that, that's like the perfect and unlikely confluence of events, but it's something that to think about when you're writing and creating these sorts of experiences. Um, how well can your story work with the world around your player? You, you don't know where they're going to be and what they're going to be doing when, when, you're, um, when you're writing, but it's, if you're telling an urgent story, then the mechanics of the game need to echo that urgency. Um, uh, the, the game Code Runner that I mentioned before did that well, where it would, you would need, sometimes it would declare that you need to move quickly because something urgent is happening. And you didn't really need to move quickly. You could walk it or as fast or slowly as, as you wanted to. But um, sometimes I found myself hurrying, even though it was a bit silly to do so. Um, one other game I wanted to shout out was um, Silent Street's Mockingbird. It also uses uh, pedometers. Um, but I really enjoyed its, its story and its writing. Um, it has some light kind of player choice going on when you talk to characters. Uh, which is actually not something I've seen very often. There's not been a lot of kind of dialogue trees or branching paths in this, this style of game. Um, I would love to see more of that. Um, I also appreciate it. It did have voice acting, but it also delivered uh, its, um, its story via text as well, um, which I just I personally find easier to digest when I'm, when I'm out and about. Um, there are plenty more examples out there, but I'm, I'm going to just list one more. Um, there was a podcast play created by Stephen Spotswood in, in DC called Walking the City, City of Silence and Stone. Um, this one breaks the genre definition a little bit because it does suggest that you go to specific places. Um, but I like what, what was done here because the suggestions are a little bit more broad. Um, for instance, the first episode, it asked that you listen to it while you were on the DC, uh, DC Metro train. But really, you could listen to it any, on any sort of transportation, any, any train anywhere, and it would be just as effective. Um, one of the episodes asked that you go to a specific historic cemetery, but really, you could go to any cemetery and, and listen to it. Um, I guess the, the one episode that had you go to the Titanic Memorial would be um, kind of tricky to duplicate, but just as good. I just really like the idea that um, he gave that kind of mood suggestion. You listen to this thing while you're physically in this kind of place. Um, that's a way to get away with that problem of tying your experience to a specific location. Um, the, the, while the other category is, is more my favorite, I actually play these kinds of experiences more because they just fit your life better. Um, you can do them anywhere. Part of my commute involves a bit of a walk. Um, so I can knock off a few minutes of, of whatever story that I'm listening to or, or reading at that time. 
Um, I can do it while I'm running, while at, the gro at the grocery store, and, and so forth. Um, you experience these worlds on, on your terms. Um, and it just it, it makes it easier to, to slot in. You know, geocaching is my like number one hobby, but I don't do it as often as I'd like because the, usually the only way I could do it is like, you know, this Saturday, you know, six months from now, I've dedicated to geocaching and nobody touch it because that's all I've got. Um, that you know, that Saturday is my day for adventure. Um, so, you know, again, not depending on specific geography uh, helps widen the game's reach. You don't have to live nearby to, to experience it, and you can do it in your own backyard. Um, and this might be a bit of blasphemy, but you can... The, another good thing about this category is you don't necessarily have to depend on GPS. Um, these experiences um, can be done without that kind of... It, you can be done with a pedometer or, or some other... Um, way of measurement to, to kind of prove that you've done the work to unlock, you know, whatever content you've, you've put behind that gate. Um, the reverse, though, is that you lose the landscape as a character with this kind of experience. You, as the writer, you don't know where they're going to be or what they're doing. And by, you know, tying an experience to a specific place just helps create that, that world just a little bit better. Um, and you know, unless your prose is so evocative that they're completely lost in your experience, having that, those things happening around them as they're, as they're listening to your characters um, makes a huge difference. Um, and you can cheat, like with the, with the walk in the city of silence and stone with, by, by creating kind of mood suggestions. Um, uh, another con kind of contradiction is I personally often struggle to focus on audio and take in the world around me. Um, especially in any great detail, if the, if the audio is long. Um, my brain tries to soak in everything that's around me, and I just I can't focus on whatever's happening in my ears. And then there's a, a really cute dog over there, and um, there's somebody running a red light over here, and I'm, I'm trying not to die. Um, and all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, I, have, I missed the last 20 seconds of the audio clip. Um, so just be mindful of, of the length of things and just... Uh, the world around them is going to be distracting the, the world around the player. Um, so throughout this presentation, I've contradicted myself a lot because location-based experiences are unique pieces of storytelling that aren't bound by any rules. I'm not the arbiter of, of this thing, of, of your creativity. Um, I'm just here to lay out some of the things that I've seen while playing and making these sorts of experiences. Um, I went through all those examples first because I want to kind of lay the bones of, of where you should maybe start when, if you're looking to create this sort of thing. Um, uh, it's a huge possibility space, and just having somewhere to start is often very helpful. Um, so how are you going to start? Um, I'll go through a few things I picked up along the way, and many of them are going to be questions without answers. Some won't have a correct answer, but there's things for you to, to think about. Um, probably the most important thing about these games and experiences is, is um, wayfinding and user experience. Um, I played so many of these where it was a really great story, but the app was terrible. Um, I didn't know where to go. I had to take my phone out of my, out of my pocket a million times. Um, it, it, having to do so doesn't feel safe, and it ruins the immersion. Um, tell me where to go. Give me clear directions. Link to Google Maps. Uh, do whatever you need to do to keep from interrupting the fun. Um, play little sound effects, make my phone vibrate. Um, I played a few of these games where I'm walking for a long time, pulled my phone out of my pocket, and realized that I un unlocked a, a clue like half mile back, or a piece of the story half mile back, and I was like, oh man, I, I, I wish I had known. I've kind of walked all this way, and uh, I could have experienced it way back there. Um, I say this, but I also realize that Often, especially when you're a small creator, um, indie creator, small team, that's, the, that's something you have the least control over most of the time. Um, most of the time you're using kind of a free platform or a cheap platform and uh, somebody else controls the experience. Um, it is what it is. Um, I'd, I'd only just started working at Trapes um, when they were pushing a, a new update to the app. And, you know, I would have loved to have changed quite a few things. Um, uh, we do what we can to, with what we can afford. Um, so you're writing this, this killer piece of fiction, something you're, you're really looking forward to, to putting out into the world. Why are you 
making a location-based game. Like, why couldn't it just live on its own, um, you know, as, as a really cool podcast or um, just a, a piece of fiction that stands on its own? What, what senses are you trying to rouse during the journey? Um, like, what do you want players to smell while they're, while they're out, um, out, out doing your thing? So I once did this multi-stage geocache that where each stage was a series of containers and each container had a snippet of the, like on a piece of paper of the story. Um, it was like this pirate story. It wasn't very good, but um, the, just being on this beach in North Carolina, finding these containers, the, the smell of the sea, the crashing of the waves, like just really made the experience fun and, and well worth it. Um, I, I just had a really great time. The, there was like a really big dead fish near one of the containers, and it was, it was disgusting, but in a weird way, it was such a great prop for the experience. And it's not something that you know, the person who put out these geocaches planned for, um, but um, <laughs> if, you, if you're writing a story that's attached to a specific place, like what are the elements of the real world that you think you can pull in? This person knew that there was gonna be driftwood and seaweed and sand and that complement their pirate story. Um, what are the things that, what are the props that um, lead, uh, that lends credence to your fiction? Um, you have to be careful with the such things because the world changes. Um, I once partook in an experience that had me go through these really pretty public gardens and the audio kept describing like very specific flowers and plants, except the experience had been released in the summer and it took me forever to get to the, to the thing and it was now winter and everything was dead. Um, and so like, I, I was a willing participant, I was willing to suspend my disbelief that, oh yes, I see the, the pretty flowers, even though there's nothing there. Um, but you know, it's something to be mindful of. You don't know when people are going to check out your thing. Um, it could be the you know, dead of winter and the, the flowers you were eager to describe are, are long gone. Um, it's pretty unlikely that a, a player is going to plow, with a, plow through your story without stopping. Um, the fun of these sorts of things is going out and, and being places that you've never been before, um, uh, being immersed in a real place. Um, give them the chance to take breaks, to explore, poke around, and then resume your story. Um, one experience I did that it brought me to this really great used bookstore, but it wanted me to run, and there was this really important thing happening, and I was just like, but there's, there's books. I want I, I want to go there. Like, why did you bring me here if you were going to have me run away so quickly? Um, you know, it's like shouting at me that I need to, needed to run. Um, so, you know, your story is probably going to have moments of panic and urgency. Try to time those for when, you know, you're having them travel a stretch where there's nothing to see, nothing to do, and you need them to move quickly. Um, don't have those, those, those moments of, 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 of urgency at interesting places. Um, for this sort of writing, you have to be the master of the, sh of the short story, um, especially it, since you're gonna have to account for the player taking breaks, um, as I just recommended, or to explore, to grab something to eat, get some coffee. Um, keeping your, short, your story short is it's hard to do, and I fall in that trap every single time and have to do massive editing. Um, but you know, I write way too much expo exposition every time. Um, but as a player, it's really hard to read a wall of text on your phone, especially if you're on a busy street corner and there's people walking by and you're, sorry, sorry. Um, you're listening to long chunks of audio and you're, you're trying to keep yourself safe. There's just too many things in the real world um, that are distractions and dangers to digest long chunks of something. Um, keep it short as best as you can. Um, the very first one of these I, that I made for Trapes um, was this kind of Civil War era national treasure-esque story where you would visit a location, answer, you know, answer the question, and then get a piece of the story as usual. Um, I had 10 stops to work with. I wrote half the story and then realized in a panic that I still had, I had five stops to go and there was no way I was going to wrap up the story in five stops, um, you know, even if I delivered huge chunks of text. Um, you know, I had, I had used up so much space with character development and exposition. Um, you know, there, there were much more efficient ways I, I could have done it. Um, in the end, I cheated in that um, you finished the walking experience, and um, I delivered the rest of the story on a web page that they would go to. 
and they could you know read that web page with you know a bajillion paragraphs thereafter. Um, wasn't wasn't my finest work, um, but in my defense, the final stop was at a brewery, so um, <laughs> at least people could order food and drinks and you know then read the rest of the story. Um, so in the end, it's about pacing, giving people the space to to digest what you've written and do so safely and fall into the into their into your story that in a way that fits their plan for the day. They may have to do, run errands or go grocery shopping or whatever, and they're just trying to squeeze in um, what little free time they have. Um, this isn't necessarily unique to the sort of experience, but one thing I've, I've noticed as I've done a lot of these is issues with perspective in your story. Are you doing first person, second person, et cetera? Um, who is the player in your story? Um, it is something that lends itself to second person very well. Uh, but sometimes when other characters are talking, um, it, feels, it feels very awkward because you can't talk back. Um, it's often, a lot of these don't have interaction points. Um, Silent Streets is probably one of the few that I've, that I've encountered that does it. Um, how does dialogue or plot development occur when it is in second person? How are you kind of communicating that to the player and talking to the player without them being able to talk back? Um, like Zombies Run always kind of cracks me up because they, they dance around this really well, but it's still there of they always have at least two characters in the room who, who then can talk to each other and you're just kind of like sitting there in the room, I guess, um, not saying anything. You're always this silent protagonist um, and anytime there's only one char other character in the room, you know they're about to monologue at you. Um, they, you know, they, they do it well, but it's, it's something that they must struggle with. Um, speaking of interaction, um, is the path that you're having the player physically walk linear? Uh, are you having them make choices that um, kind of establish the next story beats and physically where they go? Um, you know, how much of a game or experience is this? Um, there are, are subtle distinctions, and I keep kind of flipping between the two terms, but how much interaction are there? And just like any inter interactive fiction, the more choices and the more paths you, you give the player, the more you're going to have to account for, except in this case, these are physical locations you're going to have to guide them towards, and geographically, is that even possible? Is that safe to do so? Um, you're going to have to map all that out in a very literal sense. Um, this is probably more, the most uh, relevant to my day job since I'm guiding people to historical sites usually for, as, part, as part of these um, client requests. So I'm guiding the public art, interesting places. Um, and there I'm, I'm obliged to also deliver like real world facts about these places. Um, why is this place interesting? Why am I bringing you here? As well as trying to deliver my own piece of fiction. Um, you know, I take you to a statue. Who is this person and why should you care? It's tricky to do that organically when they're on a roll in your story because then it's like, oh wait, pause, this is like some Civil War general or, or whomever, like, you know, put my exciting story on, on hold for just a minute while I teach you about um, some boring historical fact. Um, but, you know, again, that's part of my job, I get paid for it, but that's something you sometimes are required to do. Why are you bringing them to this place? What, you know, is there something you want them to learn and how do you do so without interrupting your flow? Um, and, and how do you do it in a way that responsibly communicates why this place is important to you? Um, this is such a, like, a stupid thing to say, but uh, when you're asking people to run, out, run around outside, you need to be respectful of their time and their experience, um, probably more so than, than most other mediums. It's, it's rare that when you go out to do this sort of thing that the weather is glorious. Like, it's always, like, whenever I schedule these things for myself, because it's Washington, D.C., it's 95 degrees and 100% humidity, um, I still do it because that's the only time that I have. But it make, when I, you're going through a pretty stinky experience and it's gross outside, it, just, it, it really kind of lowers your morale for the, this sort of thing. Um, it, just get back, it gets back to the silent history and that whole White House uh, anecdote where uh, we work so hard to get to the Oval Office, and then just to be delivered kind of a, a terse bit of story was, was a very much a letdown. Um, so, you know, saying to write a good story or a rewarding story is, again, a silly thing to say, but it's something to be mindful of. Um, 
go out and test your own experience. Be ready to, to chop it to pieces um, if it's too long. Um, you know, see how your body feels afterwards and, and put yourself in, in other people's shoes. Um, another like really dumb declaration, but ending a story well in this just like it matters a lot. Um, a, a week finish after you've done all this running around. There, you know, one time I walked 10 miles for a thing and it just it gave me one sentence of a finish. And I was like, I walked 10 miles for that? As if the 10 miles had no like positive bearing on myself at all. Like, you know, the, the exercise was, wasn't relevant. Um, so it never hurts to end the story at somewhere, somewhere interesting, like at a brewery or a coffee shop where somebody can, can relax and, and take a breath. Um, it's important also to not strand people out in the middle of nowhere. Um, I've done a few of these where they did, where, you know, if you're going to have them going in a particular direction, um, they're going to have to walk back, probably. And they've already done your thing, so they've got nothing to do thereafter. Um, so I try, if I can't make a loop, I try to end at like a subway station or a, a, a main bus stop or somewhere like that, or at least somewhere they can hang out for a little while and, and kind of catch their breath. Um, so kind of the last part of this is because there's this extra physical element to your story, it needs to feel worth the effort. Again, a big finish. What, like, what was the reward? And, and maybe this is midstream, is each you know, kind of hook is, is, your, is a piece of story. But what are they finding? What, what is their reward for, for doing this, for physically running around the world? Um, it needs to feel like they earned it. The world around them is going about their, its business while you're, on, you're doing this secret thing. You're unlocking something that other people don't know about. Um, make it worth it. Um, so I'm going to list off some tools. This, this section is going to be pretty quick. Just you, know, you can check out the presentation later if you're looking to create this sort of thing. Um, these are all free or super cheap. Um, some of them I've not necessarily used myself, but I've, I've checked out experiences using them, and just to, to couch it a little bit more, I, there's, I'm sure there's other ones that I'm just not even aware of. Um, so uh, Sean Alexander, he created the um, locative twine code. Uh, when I actually downloaded it, it didn't work for me, um, so I spent some time tweaking it and trying to get it working. Uh, it worked for about 75% of my users, 25% couldn't figure out why it didn't work on their phones. Um, so the code is, is at that URL. Please feel free to grab it, and if you fix it, tell me so I can uh, enjoy it myself. Um, there are, there's a, here are a few audio uh, apps. They specialize in delivering pieces of audio content. Um, again, the voice map that I mentioned earlier. Um, these are more like scavenger hunt style apps, and they do, they do it in very different ways, um, but I've, I've done some really great experiences using some of these. And, Trapes is in there as well. Um, that's, that's all I've got. Any questions? Like 15, 20 minutes per chunk. You know, if you, you can make the whole thing huge, but but around there per, per bit just allows people to kind of, um, you know, a couple city blocks or, or whatever to kind of get through that and then take a break and explore or whatever. Yeah, I mean, some of those stories are among my favorites because they incorporate the, the, the things that aren't going anywhere, the big statues and that, so, that sort of thing. It, 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 that's one of the highlights of this sort of experience is you are in a place and the story is, hey, I'm looking at this statue and the story is talking about that statue. Um, the, so it's tricky because there's been plenty of where the statue is under construction and that's not in the story or, or whatever. Um, so when you're writing for these, you have to be mindful of what could move, what could disappear. Um, what grows and what, what dies, that sort of thing. Um, it's not a perfect science, but um, I w you know, in, your, in your writing, try to incorporate it as much as, of that as you can, because again, it puts the player in that spot in, in no, uh, no better way. It's tricky because people don't read. Like you can, 
Um, we're like in Trape specifically, and I've seen in plenty of other apps where they, we've got these you know pop-up screens the moment you start the experience. Like, you know, we're not responsible for you walking into traffic. You need to pay attention, et cetera, et cetera. And people just burp, 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 done. Um, I for me, you you should include all those safety warnings and and all that just for your own legal protections. But also, I find that the things I like the most that give me are ones that give me logistical information. Where should I park? Where you know, here's a rough sketch of the route if you're willing to provide such a thing. Um, it, it, I'm a planner, so it just helps me understand what I'm getting into. Because I, I, may, I may only have an hour, and all of a sudden I'm like, oh no, this thing is lo much longer than an hour, and it didn't communicate that in, on its web page at all. Um, just being clear so people can fit it into their day um, as, best as, as much as you're willing to. Yeah, I think so. I mean, the games like that have gotten so much better about not what, having you cross a four-lane highway. Um, I can't speak for them all, but yeah, I, I think it, it takes a lot of testing to make sure that you are not leading somewhere, people somewhere dangerous or inappropriate. And having mechanisms for feedback um, in case something, just for any reason really, if something changes or um, the route turns out to be dangerous because their phone, GPS is, is unreliable sometimes. It's on a cloudy day or um, it, ha it has uh, an inaccuracy of about 16 feet currently and that's getting better. But um, sometimes people's phone, phones will kind of hop around and you can't deliver an exact location. So you do need to be mindful of, you may not always be delivering them exactly where you want them to be. I haven't really, like, um, even when, the, when we did the, the Greenway Quartet and there was a big meetup and we all came together, everyone just ended up going off on their own because they did it, everyone had different walking speeds and different endurance and wanted to soak in certain pieces of terrain more. Yeah, I think multiplayer in such a word is, is not something really well explored in this space. That's one thing I, I skipped over when I was talking about the Greenway Quartet is uh, Kate Gorman, she must have done so much like actual legwork because she would plan out each audio segment to be exactly that city block. And like I felt like I was walking step in step with her because one segment would be sh extremely short because the block was short and one was much longer and she, she did that really well. So absolutely, like you, um, in those segments, you're bound by the geography of the direction you're going and the, the actual path. Um, and those segments probably need to need to talk with that that um, th that length very well. Um, yes, I actually turn off the AR for most of those because one, I just don't like being out in the world and there's like somebody on their smoke break and I'm like, hey, what's up? <laughs> like, don't mind me. Um, like silent silent streets, um, they had this whole AR. They would you know, kind of interrupt with bits of the story, but they would also interrupt with bits of AR where you were investigating a crime scene in a pretty novel way, but it didn't work for me in the out, out in the world because I'm examining a dead body on a morgue table in the middle of the subway because that just happened to be when it popped. And I'm like, I'm, I'm being you know, crushed by commuters at this moment. I can't do this right now. Um, so I usually, you know, hopefully a lot of those have that option uh, to just turn it off entirely, which then it's like, why did you put it in there at all, really? Um, it's like with Pokemon or any of those experiences, I just turn it off because it's just too weird to point my phone at people because I think you're taking their picture. Uh, it already has. I mean, there's, there's a bajillion Pokemon Go clones out there now. The one that's got, got its hooks, in, hooks into me is a Jurassic World because um, I have a little five-year-old who loves dinosaurs and I um, actually like that game a lot, but there, there, there's a Ghostbusters game. There's one I played recently where you go around collecting Catholic saints and biblical figures. <laughs> like, it was built by this uh, Catholic foundation with some tacit endorsement from the Vatican. Um, it's, it's terrible, but I was just like so enchanted by the idea of this thing. Um, <laughs> it's, so there, it's happening, it's there.
I hope so. You know, like, I don't know if anybody's played Ingress, which is kind of, which is the, um, came before Pokemon. There, there's not really, there is some story in that game. You're, there's two factions fighting against each other, and there's some kind of emergent storytelling that comes from that sort of experience. But um, I have not seen a lot of that kind of slot machine sort of experience with story attached to it. Yeah, it's something I've actually thought about just in general of the kind of the responsibility of this sort of experience for tracking change. I, I don't know what the answer is, but in the, one of the neighborhoods I used to live in became gentrified very quickly. What was, um, they had this really cool piece of public art and now there's a Trader Joe's there, um, but it was still, the public art was still in our database. And it's like, what do I do with this thing? Like, is there, are there ways that I could communicate that this was once here and why it was important to the neighborhood um, while a, a grocery store is, now sits on it? Um, how can people access that, th that thing and learn about it if they want to? Um, change is, is an, an, an inevitable part of this kind of, this kind of game. Um, and also just if you're an app developer in general, you're always having to update constantly. Code Runner is, is dead now because they just didn't feel like updating it with you know, the endless iOS you know, changes. Um, you know, these experiences come and go. I think that's, that's kind of up to you if you're going to make this sort of thing. I, you know, it's, I can't, I'm not going to declare a, a singular reason, a singular, um, you know, law for that sort of thing. Is why, why is the story that you want to tell, why could it be helped by being out in the real world? How can that complement that? Um, is again the sights, the smells, the sounds. Those are powerful, you know, um, adjectives for your story. As the kind of lightning talk we heard yesterday um, talked about, um, those are very real and can and are props in your story. Um, and or just tell a story as a as a piece of interactive fiction that they can do, that somebody can do on their laptop. Um, why why are you having the player go out into the real world? Anything else? Well, thank you. <laughs>